Good morning, Dog Nation. I am Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for George Bulldogs fans, presented today by Meriwether and Tharp. And we are happy to have you with us. A lot goes down for Georgia Pro Day yesterday. I think once again, at least in a lot of respects, this turned out to be another terrific commercial for the Georgia program overall. We'll talk about why that is. Also, Kirby Smart yesterday, perhaps saying something that's going to get some attention because of how similar it sounded to a statement that's been met with some controversy here this week. We'll tell you about that. Terrence Edwards stops by today there as well. Uh, There is a lot to uh, get to around the world of Georgia football. The spring practice rolls on. A lot of these former dogs get ready for the upcoming NFL draft. So what do you say we get ready to have a great conversation with you here today? We are so happy to have you with us for it. It is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Meriwether and Tharp, and it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Meriwether and Tharp, your source for Georgia divorce. Find them online at theatlantadivorceteam.com. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. This is an absolutely great time of year to be a sports fan. We love March Madness. Now, listen, you know, typically speaking, Georgia's not a huge part of that, although they did win last night. Now, I'm not going to say too much about this because some of y'all think I've jinxed the Georgia basketball team here this season, so I'm going to tiptoe lightly around this, but Georgia got a win last night in the SEC tournament. You love to see that very late, albeit against winless in conference play in Missouri, but nonetheless, it did happen. So college basketball this time of year makes things great. Get the Players' Championship, uh, Ponte Vedra teeing off here today. That's a precursor to the Masters. That's fun. Major League Baseball right there around the corner. We love that. Georgia Spring Practice is going on. Obviously, we live for that. And in the middle of all of this, you've got the preparations of the NFL draft, too. And I think Georgia fans really enjoy this. Even someone like me who's far more of a college football fan than an NFL fan. I think there's a lot to like about the NFL draft because, I've said before, I openly root for these Georgia players to be drafted high. We have our draft party at the end of our Dog Nation cruise each year. Always fun seeing those former dogs getting their name called. And I think this time of year, I always kind of find myself in sort of the same spot, looking at the draft hopefuls for Georgia and wondering how high they can be drafted, how many of those guys can be taken in the first round. I would say this year, no different. And just like every other year, yesterday, kind of a springboard for a lot of the, a lot, a lot of stuff to happen and for that conversation to take shape. Georgia, as you know, had its pro day. We had great coverage there at Dog Nation. In fact, if you go to our Dog Nation YouTube page, you know, Jay Black and Cody Chaffins working so hard to get a lot of those videos up there. You can see a lot of what uh, the former Georgia players had to say yesterday. But I want to start today with something that Kirby Smart had to say because pro day – not only is a showcase for the talents of former Georgia players, it is also a demonstration, I believe, and I think you feel this way too, of what makes Georgia special as a program. And Kirby Smart was very clear about that yesterday, both in terms of what it puts on display about Georgia and what Kirby Smart's able to say to NFL coaches about the players that come through this program. Good stuff from Kirby Smart yesterday. Let's hear that to start our program here today. Been a part of a really good run. I think most of them uh, have been part of the 46 of the last 48 games. They've come out on top, and uh, there's a reason why we won those football games. You have good football players, and that usually equates to that. All of these guys played a role um, in those games, and uh, they're tremendous young men, tremendous people. They've worked really long, a lot of them 22, 23 years towards this day and this goal. and. Um, this is a small step in that direction. You know a lot of these NFL coaches and, and GMs, what are some of the questions that they ask you when they're assessing the players? The same general ones we get year to year. You know, what, what's their uh, care factor for football? How important is football to them? Um, will financial opportunities change them? Are they dependable? Are they, are, they, are they good people? And I think more and more the NFLs turn into uh, getting guys that care about football and, and put team over self and We try to promote those same things here. So listen, I think what Kirby Smart describes there is the type of thing that most Georgia fans sort of intuitively believe to be true, that Georgia fans, let's just be honest here for a moment, but sort of root for Georgia players no matter what because, you know, we've been fans our entire lives and, you know, we might be willing to tolerate whatever, but, you know, Georgia fans might have a tendency or a temptation to want to root for Georgia players no matter what. But what has made 
the last few years, I would say pretty fun for most Georgia fans, is not only do you root for this team because it's the team that you've always rooted for, but rooting for a lot of the players that play at Georgia feels like a good thing to do, sort of a satisfying use of your time because it seems like, you know, not only has this been a really good team, but the players that play for Georgia are really good dudes as well, the best that we could possibly tell. And Kirby Smart, I think, has an interesting way of describing that. The care factor. These guys, the the way in which they demonstrate their care for football, their commitment to playing football the right way, I think most of us feel pretty good about rooting for UGA, encouraging our kids to root for UGA, connecting with our friends about rooting for UGA, because it seems like the dudes that play for Georgia are pretty good guys, and things like Pro Day seem to kind of demonstrate some of that kind of stuff. So when players go out and have a good Pro Day, especially ones who have demonstrated the sort of care factor that Kirby Smart describes, I think all of us have reason to celebrate, and all of us then can anticipate what's going to go down in April and say, boy, wouldn't it be great to see you know these guys get their name called in the first round? And so from that standpoint, with that in mind, you know, a couple of the guys who are sort of hanging on the brink of maybe they get into the first round, maybe they fall to the second, you know, both those guys I thought had really, really good days yesterday. And if you missed this, I think it's really fun. Let me start with Ladd McConkey. And I want to give you some of the buzz that was out there for McConkey in terms of NFL types who were there and people with big social media followings that cover the league. Uh, Taylor Biscotti, I believe that's how you say your uh, name, says the UGA wide receiver Ladd McConkey had an impressive senior bowl, combine, and now has had an impressive pro day. Dov Kleeman, once again, I believe that's how you say his name, uh, said Ladd McConkey is going off at his Georgia pro day. So big reviews for the performance of McConkey. We already raved about him going back to what he did in Indianapolis at the NFL scouting combine. And speaking of raving about McConkey, that's also something that Kirby Smart was doing yesterday there as well in talking about the way in which McConkey became the player at Georgia that he is and now working on becoming the kind of, I would say, unquestioned NFL draft uh, prospect, a guy who had the production on field when healthy and is now matching that with some really strong testing numbers. Kirby Smart talking in more detail yesterday about what it is that makes Lad McConkey Lad. Just it started from the time that we offered him to to now. He's um, ascended and uh, aspired to be great. And nobody works harder than Lad McConkey. And I think there, nobody on our team would say there's a better teammate than Lad McConkey. I don't know that he's ever um, said a negative word about anybody. He's just such a good kid. He's such a hard person to find. Um, and uh, he's a great football player on top of that. And doesn't that sound good, feel good to hear? Don't you love that? That uh, Lad McConkey's a great teammate. Lad McConkey works hard. Lad McConkey sort of always done the right thing. And Kirby Smart, obviously, is going to vouch for his players. We understand that. But those are the types of things that you don't necessarily say that specific unless you truly mean them. However, the flip side of that coin is, Listen, this is not some, you know, golly gee whiz, aw shucks, sort of, you know, good guy, you know, there because of some intangibles. No, this is a guy who was also a tenacious competitor on the field there as well and succeeded mightily at Georgia because of that. And that's also the mindset that Ladd takes with him to the NFL. And Kirby Smart had a chance to talk yesterday about how early it was in the process that Georgia was able to identify that even when perhaps a lot of other programs that Ladd McConkey could have gone to, programs that could have had Ladd McConkey, perhaps they didn't see what Kirby Smart said Georgia saw in McConkey that gave them the vision that some of this kind of stuff could have come true for him. More of Kirby talking about Ladd yesterday. A chip on his shoulder, a young man that wanted to prove everybody wrong. And, uh, you know, we bet on him to be a good player, and uh, he did. And uh, he was very productive and uh, we're fortunate to have kids like that in our state that, that get overlooked and work really hard. And um, luckily, we have enough staff people here that we were able to find him. The point is, is Ladd McConkey's more than just a good story. He is a really good player, and it is a successful story of Georgia's scouting efforts, big staff, uh, casting a wide net and finding guys like McConkey. And by the way, it wasn't just someone like Ladd who has a chance to be in the first round. Maybe it's a second round pick for him, but has a chance to get in the first round. That wasn't the only former Georgia player who had sort of a similar thing going on yesterday. Another one of those guys is Kamari Laster. And Laster, we know what the film looks like. He was a shutdown corner, uh, a truly stellar performer for Georgia's defense last season. But like a lot of these sort of pre-draft situations, 
He's going to be poked and prodded based on his uh, numbers, his measurables, what he does there. And I'll show you what Field Yates said about uh, uh, Kamari last year yesterday. That, and Field Yates got a big following. This is a, a well-respected NFL reporter on X yesterday. Field saying there was some speculation on Georgia cornerback Kamari Laster in his 40 time uh, at the school's pro day. According to four NFL personnel in attendance, he ran between, and I get this now, ran between a 4.50 uh, and a 4.51. Like how much space is there in between a 4.50 and a 4.51? I'm not quite so sure about that. But nonetheless, that time, Yates says, is plenty fast enough for one of the best players in the entire draft class. In other words, the film uh, demonstrates this is a really good player. Now, the testing measurables seem to match up with that there, too, which I would say is another example of a pre-draft success story for Georgia. And much the same way, Kirby Smart had some really good things to say about Ladd McConkey. Kirby Smart was also there to talk about uh, Kamari Laster and exactly what Field Yates said, a guy who has proven it on the football field, exactly how good of a player he can be, Kirby Smart once again. He'll be a tremendous player no matter where they play him. He can play the nickel slot. He can play safety. Uh, he can play corner. Um, he's a ball hawk. He's super competitive. You know, some people have a knack for finishing and getting the ball out. That's one thing that he has a really good knack for finishing on the ball and getting the ball out. And corners are hard to find. Uh, it's a throw first league. So you got to find people that can cover man to man. And he has the ability to do that. Listen, I love that. I, I love the way in which Kirby describes that. I love the day that Kamari Laster apparently was able to have yesterday. It thrills me to think that he also, much like Ladd McConkey, is kind of justifying his case to potentially be a, a first-round pick, one of the top cornerbacks taken in the upcoming NFL draft. Now, let me close all of this by saying this. Listen, like I know at times I'm probably a little corny. I, I do get that. That's just how God made me, I guess. And I'm probably – a little over sentimental from time to time. Maybe that's true there as well. But I think days like yesterday are really important because when you pay attention to some of the other stuff going on in football, and we'll get there probably before today's show is done, when you pay attention to some of the other stuff that goes on in football, man, it's easy to get cynical sometimes. And it's easy to sort of wonder what all of this is about and what is this for and does it mean what it think we think it means and it's easy to sort of think that way and have that conversation. When you see guys like Lab McConkey, when you see guys like Kamari Laster, when you see a million other former Georgia players who do these type of things each and every year, I think it not only makes you feel good about Georgia, but in a certain way it sort of restores your faith in football a little bit too. But This is still an incredible springboard for young men to become fully grown men and to become go from college players to NFL stars and use this draft process as a way to – take care of their family for a long time to come. Hard work paying off for a lot of Georgia players yesterday. It's one of the things that makes this time on the sporting calendar such a fun thing to experience each and every year. My name is Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans presented today by Meriwether and Tharp. Glad to have you with us across all video platforms at 10, radio, Athens Sports Radio 960, The Ref, podcast, wherever you find them. Talk about the Apple Player, the Spotify. We post the show at theworldfamousdognation.com. Our longtime loyal folks there in our podcast, we just really, really appreciate you clicking in and being a part of that. And by the way, if you sometimes watch us live on video, you want the show on demand later on, we'd say the podcast platform may be the best way for you to go and connect with all of that. And we're certainly glad for those of you who do all of that with us on a regular basis. Of course, we are so thankful to have our friends at Meriwether and Tharp who make the show possible for you there as well. Your source for Georgia divorce. Now, when I say Georgia divorce, I mean Georgia now because for a long time, our friends at Meriwether and Tharp have obviously been taking care of folks in the Atlanta area. That's kind of where their home base was and where they've been. And I know a lot of folks here in the Atlanta area who, you know, facing some challenging times, facing a divorce situation, really trusted Meriwether and Tharp to help get them through that situation. And they'll tell you, while they weren't happy to be going through a divorce, they were certainly satisfied with the outcome they got on the other side of that divorce process, which is obviously perhaps the best that you can hope for. Meriwether and Tharp, all about that. But what they've been doing for a long time in the Atlanta area, now they're sort of stretching that out and providing that for the entire state of Georgia now. Offices in Savannah, Peachtree City there for the folks on the south side. Now in Athens there as well. Uh, these offices taking care of folks in these communities the same way they've been taking care of folks in the Atlanta area for such a long time. So when we say your source for Georgia divorce, that's what we mean. And there's a new website to match that. It's georgiadivorceteam.com. 
georgiadivorceteam.com, the website to go to and learn more about that. And when you get there, you can experience a lot of free resources like blog posts and podcasts and things like that. But you can also see an array of options for you to perhaps sift through and choose from in terms of giving yourself the cost certainty of exactly what this divorce is going to mean for you from a financial standpoint. What kind of financial commitment do you make to sort of see yourself through this? And you can do everything from like sort of a do-it-yourself type option that can be as low as $99. If you want to go the flip side of that and have the sort of full representation, traditional uh, relationship with Meriwether and Thought, they'll provide that for you there as well. And also a good number of options in between those two, including one of the things you've perhaps heard me talk about before, which is their model M&T level of service, which includes either a flat fee to pay for this or kind of a subscription fee that you can pay on a per month basis as your divorce process is ongoing. Just one of the, I think, really clever, creative ways that Meriwether and Tharp seeks to serve those who find themselves in a challenging situation. So please find them online. Uh, once again, the website, georgiadivorceteam.com. That's georgiadivorceteam.com. Meriwether and Tharp is your source for Georgia divorce. All right, we're going to get Terrence Edwards here coming up in a little bit. Fun conversation coming up with him today, looking back on Pro Day, looking in on spring practice, and also, you know, certainly the uh, challenging story we've talked about some this week, too. Terrence, of course, very close with Pierce Sperlin. Uh, we'll get some thoughts from Terrence on that coming up in just a moment there as well. Prior to that, let's go around the doghouse. Poured today by our friends at Dr. Pepper. Love having Dr. Pepper as a part of Around the Doghouse here today. And I want to go back in time just briefly to yesterday because I would say the most talked about thing around college football here this week are the words that Nick Saban used when he was a part of a congressional committee or uh, this this week, a hearing on the future of NIL and the professionalization of college players and the possible like unionization coming there. And Nick Saban sort of speaking out pretty forcefully against an NIL culture that he sees as pervasive in college football right now. This got a lot of attention. You heard this yesterday. But as a reminder, let me let you hear it again here today, a few seconds worth of Nick Saban from Congress. All the things that I believed in for all these years, 50 years of coaching, no longer exist in college athletics. So it's always was about developing players. It was always about uh, helping people be more successful in life. Uh, my wife even said to me, we'd have all the recruits over on Sunday uh, with their parents for breakfast, and uh, she would always meet with the mothers and uh, talk about how she was going to help and uh, impact their uh, sons and how they would be well taken care of. And she came to me, you know, like right before I retired and said, why, why are we doing this? And I said, what do you mean? She said, all they care about is how much you're going to pay them. So we kind of joked about this a little bit yesterday. There's an element of what Nick Saban says there that almost feels like the Simpsons meme, but the old man yelling at the cloud was the Abraham Simpson that does that. Sort of feels like Nick Saban kind of comes across pretty angry, you know, pr pretty ornery about the way in which his coaching career came to an end and the kids these days type vibe that he sort of gives off there. And a lot of Georgia fans love jumping on that. A lot of people were just not Alabama fans. They like the idea of, oh, listen to Nick Saban now. You know, he didn't get that last national championship, and he's kind of pouting about it. They're kind of angry about that. And listen, we're fans, too. We like stirring the pot with that kind of stuff. Obviously, when it comes to, to making a little bit of fun of Nick Saban every now and then, of course, we sometimes enjoy doing that. But if you go too far down that road with Nick Saban on the basis of that clip, I think the, the tough thing that it becomes for a Georgia fan to reconcile a bit is, is the fact that yesterday at Pro Day, when Kirby Smart was meeting with reporters, unsolicited, by the way, he kind of pivoted a question about, you know, talking to NFL draft scouts and GMs and things like that uh, and, and how that kind of reflects on Georgia recruiting. He kind of pivoted on his own, unsolicited, in a direction that made him yesterday sound an awful lot like what Nick Saban had said the day before. Kirby Smart, Nick Saban saying in Congress, listen, all these kids care about today is the money. That seems sort of overly harsh and excessively negative when Nick Saban says it. But in a little bit more of perhaps a judicious way, maybe a little bit more of a even-handed way, Kirby Smart, when being asked about how recruits see a Georgia Pro Day, said something that sounds just a, a little bit similar. Let me let you hear this yesterday from Georgia Pro Day. It's a great sell for the kids that will listen to it because there's a lot of them that want to ask about NIL. They don't want to ask about what your uh, NFL players have done. Um, but I think it's much more important how you develop players than how much NIL you give so listen, I said this earlier, I realize I'm probably corny at times and, you know, sort of corny guys like me, traditionalists like me, 
of course, we are probably prone to say, you need to listen to these coaches. You know, uh, you need to listen to Nick Saban. Even though we don't really always love Nick Saban, uh, you need to listen to what Nick Saban's saying here. We obviously do love Kirby Smart. Kirby a little bit more, a little bit younger. I'd say a little hipper than Nick Saban, typically speaking. Uh, a little bit more kind of with it, with sort of, you know, current culture perhaps. But even Kirby Smart says, listen, not every recruit wants the pitch of Pro Day. Some recruits care more, more about NIL than they care about NFL. That's Kirby Smart expressing that as a concern, very, very similar to what Nick Saban said there a moment ago. And I think some people sort of want to disregard that. They want to disregard people like me because it's sort of uncool to be on the side of the establishment in a situation like this. That's what some people sort of view coaches to be. But there are some media people who are probably cooler than me who seem to be sort of saying the same thing too, right? I mean, it's like, you know, maybe at times I'm too traditional. Maybe at times I'm a little corny. But someone like, say, Scott Van Pelt on ESPN, he's sort of thought to be kind of a cool media guy. Got a cool job. He hosts the Midnight Sports Center. People like that. This week, Scott Van Pelt also seemed to be agreeing with a lot of what Nick Saban had to say, and it's at least worth considering. If so many people are saying something so similar, is there a chance that maybe we ought to listen to some of what it is they're saying? Here's Scott Van Pelt from SportsCenter. Naturally, the reaction to Saban's comments on social media was measured. Oh, so you get to care about money and they don't. I get the point, but keep in mind that this man is the all-time winningest coach in the sport in terms of titles, and he's working. He's, he's a professional, so that's why he gets paid all the dough. It's fantastic that players get to make money now, but every single coach in every single revenue sport, if you're paying attention, is saying the same thing. This is the only thing that any recruit is asking about now when they come on visits. And I don't believe that it's pearl clutching to wonder if maybe that's not ideal. Maybe something about the school and your development there as a human being ought to count as part of your process and your, your line of thinking because overwhelmingly these athletes are going to have to find a job which isn't football when they leave. Sure, get your money, but there's, there's more to it. At least you're supposed to be, right? Let me conclude this this way. I think that Scott Van Pelt's got a lot of credibility. People like him. He's popular. He's got a job that creates a lot of attention for him. And if he's taking Nick Saban's word seriously, then perhaps we should there as well. And even if we're sort of prone to want to mock Saban, if what Kirby Smart is saying is similar to also what Nick Saban's saying, perhaps we then also ought to take that somewhat seriously. And by the way, taking the words of Saban and Kirby seriously and the words of Scott Van Pelt seriously – doesn't mean that you're anti-compensation for players. It just means that you see more value in college football than just the sort of relatively meager compensation NIL can provide in exchange for the sort of long-term development that you can achieve and go on to great riches in the NFL. Coaching still matters in the sport. In other words, at least it should. The development you get from those coaches should still matter. That's what was on display for Georgia's Pro Day yesterday, and even in an NIL age, that's the kind of stuff that probably should still be getting more attention than perhaps it currently is based on what Nick Saban is saying and based on what Kirby Smart is saying, and as Scott Van Pelt says, based on what a lot of other coaches are saying there as well. It's at least food for thought, and that is around the doghouse here today. Uh, poured by our friends at Dr. Pepper. As we said before, love having Dr. Pepper a part of around the doghouse here just for the simple reason that uh, – I couldn't figure out the right camera to go to there for a moment. Uh, just for the simple reason that uh, Dr. Pepper is such, such a, uh, a thing that I've just loved for a long time. So proud to have them a part of the uh, show here today. So listen, when you're out there shopping for your groceries, when you're out there doing that each and every week, make sure you're picking up the rich, delicious, one-of-a-kind flavor of Dr. Pepper. You see that number 23 right there in the can? You know what that means. There are 23 different flavors uh, in Dr. Pepper. And when you know that, all the different flavors and how many there are, uh, that's truly a pepper thing right there. And so that's what Dr. Pepper is all about. Stop by your local Kroger or wherever it is that you're uh, doing your grocery shopping, and you can enjoy some Dr. Pepper here today because it truly is a pepper thing. And it's great to have Dr. Pepper as a part of Around the Doghouse for us here today. All right, so we got a lot to do here on the program. Uh, before we are done, there was a pretty surprising move made in the SEC yesterday that, frankly, I don't think I saw coming, but I think it does sort of speak to 
maybe a little bit of a, a win now mood starting to kind of uh, take shape around one of the league's teams. We'll tell you more about that here coming up in just a little bit. My understanding is that Terrence Edwards not quite ready to go. Is Oh, he is ready. Okay, so Terrence Edwards is ready. So let's keep the conversation going here today on everything going on with Pro Day, spring practice, and everything else. Let's bring on Terrence Edwards here today, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Thar. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. Let's bring on Terrence Edwards here. A lot to talk about with him today. Always great to have his time on our program. And uh, Terrence, before you join us, we heard Nick Saban in Congress, Kirby Smart sort of unsolicited yesterday at Pro Day, expressing some concerns here about what they say are players maybe caring more about the NIL part of this than than some of the development part of that. Um Easy to disregard that if you're, you know, really in favor of, you know, some of the professionalization of the college players and things like that and the sort of, you know, radical change that some people propose for the sport. There are also another side of people are going to say, listen, if these very successful coaches are saying something like this, you know, maybe it should be taken more seriously. Where do you come down when you hear Saban expressing concern about, you know, kids these days, all they care about is the money? And Kirby Smart kind of saying something that sounded at least a little similar to that. What do you make of these coaches sort of sounding off this way about this particular topic? Uh, I can understand where they're coming from uh, because a lot of kids, that's the first thing that they do want to know is, you know, how much money that I would be making or what can you offer me? Um, you know, now that's the, instead of how can you develop me is how much money can you offer me to come to your school? And that's the conversation that the coaches are having and, on one end, I can understand the frustration coming from the coaches, but then on the player's perspective, you know, players like me who didn't have this opportunity, so mm-hmm. I understand, you know, if, you know, being able to make this kind of money, more money than, you know, my family have ever seen. So I can understand from that standpoint as well that, you know, they would like to get compensated. So it's, I just think we have to meet in the middle somewhere. Um, I think it's kind of got a little out of control, especially for, the high school aspect of it. I love that fact that Carson Beck was able to go and prove himself on the field. Now he's able to cash in on his name, likeness, image. And I think that's what the the whole spirit of that was entitled, entitled for, not going out buying players that which, um, you know, I'm okay with the players getting the money, but we got to find a, a balance somewhere. Uh, for the coaches and the players. I think you bring up a really good point. You talk about kind of meeting the middle because here's what I see, Terrence. And I would say that you're someone who sort of exists somewhat in the middle. You know, got the foot in the coaching world. You got the foot in the player world. And so I would say you do kind of exist in the middle on something like this. But for those people who are sort of more on one side or the other, excessively pro player or excessively kind of pro establishment, for lack of a better way of saying this, what happens is is that one side sort of paints the ugliest possible picture of the other, kind of like a demonization. In other words, you know, when you hear Nick Saban say what he says, there are going to be some people who are like, you know, Nick Saban doesn't want players to get paid at all. You know, he's, you know, he, he wants all the money for himself. You know, we have some public statements that would lead you to believe that's certainly not true about Nick Saban. That's what some people say. The flip side of that is, is that, you know, people who are a little bit more traditional look at the players like all they care about is money. They're, you know, into their cars. They're into their, you know, I don't even know what what they're wearing, whatever else. They don't care about the other stuff whatsoever. I would say that's equally false, that the demonization of both sides of this issue probably needs to stop. And a little bit more of a realistic conversation needs to take place that for as much as players do, I think, justifiably deserve to get paid and obviously want to get paid, the facts are – if you're going to get paid in college a sum that's, let's say, less than $2 million, that money's not going to last you the rest of your life anyway. So you better have some development, whether it be educational development or professional development or just sort of like, you know, growing into a sort of a full-fledged man. You better have some development because, as Scott Van Pelt said in the clip we played a moment ago, you were eventually going to have to make some money doing something other than playing college football so you better hope you're prepared to do that for when that time comes, no matter how far into the future that time eventually does come for you. Oh, that's most definitely. I mean, we can contest that how fast it goes. You know, my four years at Georgia was like mm-hmm. a blur now. Yeah. And, you know, if you were making this type of money uh, for the four years and unfortunately you don't do not develop into a NFL or professional caliber, caliber athlete, 
then you're going to have to do something. And that money is going to be dramatically lower than what you're making there. So I, I hope these players understand that this money is not going to last forever. It's not going to take care of you for the rest of your life. So do something, you know, do something good with this money, uh, especially for the ones that, 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 don't making it to the professional ranks that's still making this type of money. I hope they're having someone uh, in their ear telling them how to make this money work for them for the next few years or for the rest of their lives. Um, but that's the sad part of it, that if you don't become a professional athlete, we all know, let's just be real. You're not going to make that money right off in the real world. Yeah. And I don't like even saying the real world because I still think that is the real world, but uh, outside of the outside of the sporting world, I will just say. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think, I think you're right about that. Pro Day was yesterday. I think it's fun. You know, you also watch this in a little bit different way than I probably will because you have more familiar with the drills. You kind of know technique for these drills. When you're watching Pro Day, what are you watching? And, and, and what did you notice about the Georgia players yesterday who went through some of this? I didn't get to see all of it. I got to saw. I got to see uh, some of lad clips on the internet, and uh, it, it just go out there and, and it just checks off more boxes that you already know. Um, it's it's a lot to do with nothing, in my opinion, uh, because the film is going to tell you everything that you need to know. Uh, but it goes back, and if you a guy runs faster than he projected, now you just go back to the film and see does he play fast we could run fast but i like a lot of people need to know do you play fast um so i, I think you know last year in a run of four six yesterday um that i saw on twitter but we all see that he plays faster than a four six so you know now teams is going to go back and look at this film and see how that adds up to the film it, does he play four six so it just it, it, it's going out there and it's putting on the show and i think lab put on the show and now it's really going to be you know, I'm waiting to see where Lad is going to fall into draft. I, I have a, I have a uh, speculation what I believe, but um, you never know because it only take you one team to like you. Yeah, I mean, I guess my thought here is, is you know, at this point, why couldn't he be a first round pick? Because if the numbers are what they're supposed to be, and it seems like they are, the production when he was healthy, that's what it was supposed to be too. We will never know how productive he could have been this year, but if you sort of use his what uh, next to last year in 2022 as a little bit of a uh, of a guess on that you know he could have approached a thousand yards this year had he played the full season unfortunately he just wasn't healthy enough to do that if you want to knock him for the injury I, I guess you could but my gosh this is football people get hurt uh, the point is you, you know you see him run past people in the game you see him be an effective target in the red zone the measurables in these testing situations match what you feel like you see on film why couldn't he be a first round pick he could. I think he's a first-round talent. Um, just the, it's crazy that the year that he's coming out, we are so deep at the re receiver That's position. Right. That's right. And I just and I just think I just think a lot of people just going to get knocked down because it, we're so deep. Uh, and that's not a knock on their ability. Vlad get knocked to the second round. It's, it has nothing to do with his ability. It's just we're the receiver position this year. Unfortunately, just so deep with a lot of good receivers. So it's just what a team is looking for. Um, I mean, I, I would love to see Lad get drafted to Kansas City somewhere where yeah. you play with a, a generational quarterback. Like, I understand we all want to get drafted as high as possible, but sometimes getting drafted to the right situation is better for your long long run of sports making money. Um, so I love Lad. I think whoever gets Lad is going to have uh, a special, special person because I know him uh, along with a special talent. Speaking of people that you know, as we kind of transition to Georgia spring practice, unfortunately, spring practice started off with some very tough news, and that's the fact that Pierce Sperlin, a guy that you know very well, dealing with a very serious health issue. Now, my understanding, Terrence, is is that he is healthy. This is more of a precautionary thing, the type of thing they're they're doing so they can stay healthy. But uh, obviously, the, the the heart issue going to cause Sperlin to retire from football and stay around the program, but not as an active player. Terrence, you mentioned your college career going by in a blur, but at the same time, I know that you enjoyed every minute of it. I know that Pierce was looking forward to a terrific career, and a lot of folks thought that he had a chance to be a, a really good football player. Um, how tough is this for, for that young man and his family? I, I hope that you'll tell them how 
you know, sorry we are, and obviously, you know, praying for them. Our words, you know, don't probably mean a whole lot in a situation like this. But uh, what's that like to have to to see a young man make that decision for the betterment of his lifelong health, not just his health to be able to play, but his health to be able to exist as a happy adult after his college career is done, you know, you know, a long, productive life here. You know, what's that been like for the Sperlin family as of late? Well, I, I, I spoke with Piercy uh, the week of their spring break, and uh, he was excited about you know, the opportunity to compete and, um, and earn playing time and excited for spring. And he told me that he was going to wear number eight this year. So okay. that was an exciting, exciting thing for him. So we were just texting each other back and forth. And once I heard the news, it was just heartbreaking because I know how this kid loves the University of Georgia. His whole family loved the University of Georgia. So I'm just happy. If we look at the bright side, I'm just happy he got to experience the opportunity to play college football, something that, he's been wanting to do, especially at the University of Georgia, since he was born. So I'm happy that he got that opportunity. But you just know, once you have to sit down with your family and make a, a tough decision like this, I'm sure it's hard for him. But I think it was the right thing to do from what, you know, reading about his long-term yeah. health. He's still going to be a, a part of the program. He's still going to be around, and he's still a damn good dog, in my opinion. So um, I'm just happy that he got the opportunity to experience Georgia football. No, I think that's I think that's well said. I think you're exactly right. Beyond that, you know, it certainly seems to be interesting right now, you know, Georgia welcoming in some new pass catching targets. We talked about this a little bit yesterday. The need for Carson Beck to get on the same page with those guys quickly. We asked Jake Fromm this yesterday from a quarterback standpoint. By the way, in his career, he had to do this with guys like Lawrence Cager, who came in and you know, it seems like Jake found a rapport with them pretty quickly. But on the other side of this, you know, if you're a receiver you know, one of these transfers that comes in, how do you get up and running as fast as possible? And how do you develop that connection with your quarterback? Because, you know, for Georgia to go where it needs to go offensively and replace some of the statistical production that, you know, guys like Brock Bowers and Lad McConkey and Marcus Roseme Jackson, who we also saw at Pro Day yesterday, what they were responsible for, Georgia needs a pretty significant contribution from some of these uh, transfer players. Terrence, how do they hit the ground running as fast as possible? Well, you, you got to do a lot of these things on your own, doing the off-season conditioning. Uh, that's where the, the leaders of the team, or the Carson Beck, son, go out there and script seven on seven, go out there and just throw the football around. This is the time where Carson, as the leader of the team, get those receivers. Let's go out and run routes and, and catch the football and um, get the understanding of everyone's body movement. So though that is on the players, and now, now it's time to put this – on tape with the with the coaches, put this with the pads, put this against competition against uh, the DB. So those are the things that they're looking for now. And just like you said, the quarterback receiver combo, we we have to know everyone's movement. I, mean, I, I just heard a story where uh, the quarterback for the Falcons who they just signed, Kirk Cousins, um, yeah. Kirk Cousins asked to see all the receiver catches from their basically their high school days because he's trying mm. to see how they run routes. He's trying to see their body movements. And that's what a great quarterback does is just try to get to know his receivers uh, pretty fairly quickly. Um, so that's I, I believe Carson Beck is going to do that and have done that. Now just taking it to spring practice. And I'm excited to see what some of the new guys is able to do. And I'm ready to see Dominique Love really, you know, take the next step. Now he's he's comfortable in a Georgia yeah. uniform. And I think he's he's really going to be able to take the next step as one of those transfer receivers came from last year. Yeah, I think we would say probably maybe due to be on the field a little bit more this year, right? I mean, Georgia probably going to do two tight end sets a lot because they like to do that. But, you know, it seems like he was probably more on the field last year when Brock Bowers wasn't playing. And so – Therefore, maybe the change over the Bowers, maybe that creates an opportunity. I know that Ben Yurisek is going to be a part of this story eventually, too. Obviously, he hasn't arrived yet. But you almost wonder if some of the thing for uh, Lovett is he's just on the field as a as sort of a greater presence in the offense because of the fact that Brock Bowers is no longer here. Yes, I, I'm assuming that we'll be a more 11 personnel, traditionally 11 personnel than we have done before because of, of Brock. And now with the talented receivers that we have to continue to get those guys on the field. Uh, so they're going to give Dominique Lovett more opportunities to catch. I just like his, his skill set along with the others. So uh, I can't wait to get down there and just go in and evaluate. And, you know, Robert has been there all week and he just 
he saw he saw Dylan Bell for the first time up close, and he called me. He was like, "Man, I didn't realize he was that big." So oh. I'm just ready to get down there and just see uh, some of the guys and see the new guys, see Humphrey, see Kobe, just see a lot of the new guys and see what you know um, what they're going to bring to the table. Did Robert say anything about what he's seen from Josh Crawford so far as the running backs coach? You know, I know there's a little bit of a transition there, and with four new coaches overall, you know, on the one hand. Hey, that's a lot of. I think the word that got used onboarding, and you're doing this as you, with your own staff there at, uh, at Mount Vernon. You got a lot of. You got to get a lot of you know coaches up to speed quickly about how things operate at Georgia. But the flip side of that is there's also the positive of a guy like Crawford can bring some new energy. James Coley being bra- ba- back could maybe bring some new energy. Certainly on the defensive side, we know T. Rob's capable of br- providing that, and perhaps Dante Williams is there too. Any thought about, you know, the fact that Georgia's got a spring practice right now with almost half of your assistant coaches being new guys? Did Robert notice anything about that? Or just your overall thoughts about what that new blood could mean for the energy here at Georgia spring practices? Well, Robert really liked Crawford. Um, Robert really thought he was doing some really nice things in that room. And um, I don't know the comparison between him and Dale. I didn't spend that much time around Dale as, as Robert has. Um but he just he just liked the energy that Coach Crawford has has brought so far. I, I knew Coach Crawford from Georgia Tech because he recruited some of my guys at Milton, so I kind of uh, got to know him a little bit through the recruiting process. But uh, for right now, Robert is is so far so good. Well, that is great to hear, Terrence. We certainly appreciate your insight on all of that. And of course, when it comes to working with guys like Pierce Sperlin, something you did for a long time, and working with Lad McConkey, something you also did there as well. You're working with that next generation of pass catchers right now. So for people who want to be a part of the Terrence Edwards Wide Receiver Academy, how they can get in touch with you. And as you said before, bubble work now is not just wide receivers. you got quarterbacks out there. you got defensive backs out there. You're essentially playing football with, with all these guys right now. So for people who want some of the training that you and uh, your buddies are a part of, uh, how can they get in touch? Yes, and it, it is, it's crazy to me that I see everything that Lad was able to do yesterday at his pro day, a lot of the drills that – the NFL guys are doing. Those are the same things that I'm doing with the bubble work. So if you're looking to come and get perfect your craft and do some of the drills that the pros are doing, find me on all social media platforms at Terrence Edwards Wide Receiver Academy. I love it, Terrence. Appreciate your time, and we will look forward to talking to you again here very soon on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Tharp. Thank you. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. I, for the most part, live in this studio. I don't get a chance to be outside this box very frequently, but I've been to Georgia Pro Day a couple of times before. I'm always really fascinated by it because, as Terrence said, when you see some of the cone drills and the things like that, I, I think you really see a pretty good representation of what football is. You know, I don't know how well the 40-yard dash actually resembles what football actually is. I'm probably not the first one to say that. But cone drills, things like that, short shuttles, you know, that looks like football, right? That ability to move quickly in a short space, laterally, diagonally. That's what football sort of is. And seeing that in a pro day situation, you do get a better understanding of why some scouts want to see drills like that because it does, I would say, closely resemble what football can be. And I still believe that when it comes to general managers, scouts, personnel men, whatever, I think the batting average will never be much higher than 50-50. I just always believe that. An individual evaluation of an individual player is only going to be about as accurate as a coin flip. So, therefore, it's all about the story you want to tell yourself if you're wrong. And for me, I would rather bet on on field productivity more so than workout promise, you know, workout possibility. Give me at least the proven commodity who's played well on the field. But I do understand why there's that extra level of confidence in a draft pick that comes along when. You can back up some measurables to go along with some, uh, you know, positive performance on the field. And obviously, for a lot of Georgia guys yesterday, they had a chance to do just that. Now, let's get ready to go cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. And of course, as I believe I referenced a little earlier, as you head towards the NFL draft, what you're heading to is the final night of our Dog Nation cruise. And when we're on board, you know, it's been Independence Thieves the last couple of years. It's going to be a lure of the seas this year. When we're on board the ship, and have a chance to celebrate on that final night with our draft party. What a fun and terrific experience that always is when you hear those names called. I always remember our 2022 uh, draft party when you end up getting five Georgia players drafted. And, you know, Lewis Seen goes relatively late, and everybody's fired up about that. And everybody in the ship's looking around like, who are these crazy Georgia people who keep cheering for this NFL draft? 
such a fun experience and such a reminder of just how fun it's going to be to be on board Allure of the Seas, the very first time ever a Dog Nation cruise taking place on an Oasis-class ship. And boy, when it, when it comes to sailing on great ships like that and having a great time, you have your chance to do the same thing here. And Jessica Slater is a terrific travel agent who can help you out with it. One of the reasons why we love the Oasis-class ships, because as you see there, you've got the Aqua Theater on the back of the ship. For those of you watching on video, that's where the High Dive Show takes place. It's the Boardwalk neighborhood. You get the Central Park neighborhood right there nestled in kind of the middle part of the ship. A lot of bars and lounges and especially restaurants are part of all of that. It's just the ultimate and sort of, you know, entertainment experience and dining experience and just sort of a recreational experience. There's nothing like what one of these Oasis class ships can provide for you. And that's why if you can't be on board, a lure of the seas with us on the Dog Nation cruise, you need your own Royal Caribbean cruise vacation. Perhaps for you, it's the brand new Oasis class ship set to sail uh, in July of this year or Icon of the Seas, which, you know, I've already been on. I mean, it's been sailing since January. What a great time to experience the best that Royal Caribbean has to offer. And Jessica Slater, the one to kind of get you connected with all of that. Call her, 770-718-9147. That's 770-718-9147. Or email her, jslater at dreamvacations.com. I would say this is pretty surprising news. So we know that Texas A&M has been in need of a new athletic director because its previous athletic director, Ross Bjork, left to go to Ohio State sort of thought to be a step up because Ohio State is more successful in sports. It's also one of the sort of the big flagships in all of college football. A lot of folks thought that was somewhat surprising because while Ohio State's a good job, I don't know that there's a whole lot of evidence to suggest that Ross Bjork had done a good job in his previous stops, either at Texas A&M, where he rather nonsensically gave a big uh, contract extension to Jimbo Fisher without much reason to justify it. And going back to that, perhaps not the best judge of character when it comes to Hugh Freeze at Ole Miss and situations such as that. But Bjork, nonetheless, somewhat surprisingly, got the Ohio State job, uh, leaving Texas A&M the process. So the Aggies been looking for an athletic director, and now they found one. Now, AD talk doesn't exactly move the needle. I, I do get that. But this, to me, was somewhat interesting. Trev Alberts, who, by the way, some of y'all will remember, many, many years ago, Trev Alberts was an analyst working on ESPN. He was living in Athens. This is early 2000s. He was on the, like the late night, you know, what do you call it? Like scoreboard final or whatever the name of the show was. Always very pro Georgia. He was always battling Mark May. Do y'all remember this years ago? Always very pro Georgia, sort of battling against Mark May, who for whatever reason was kind of anti-Georgia. That was sort of the shtick. Uh, so a lot of Georgia fans have always kind of liked Trev Alberts. Well, Alberts was a Nebraska grad or still is a Nebraska grad, uh, a, a Nebraska alumnus and was athletic director at Nebraska. Sort of seemed like a dream job situation. Obviously, Nebraska sort of thought to be an athletic department on the rise. They seem to have access to a lot of NIL. They have uh, poets uh, recently committed as quarterbacks uh, to the 2024 class. There seems to be a lot going on there at Nebraska, but apparently not enough going on at Nebraska for an alumnus of the program to want to stay there in Lincoln. Trev Alberts is bolting for Texas A&M, so... In the ongoing arms race between the SEC and the Big Ten and, you know, trying to decide does the Big Ten deserve to be treated as an equal to the SEC, this perhaps a little bit of a suggestion that no, maybe it doesn't because um, if A&M, not the, you know, top program in the SEC, is pulling a graduate of Nebraska away to come be athletic director, essentially spurning his alma mater, which means he'll never be welcome back in Lincoln again, you wouldn't think. Um, it's a pretty big power move in the part of the SEC, an example of the Big Ten perhaps – Still having a lot of ground to catch up with there. A pretty interesting story. We talked the other day about, you know, the possibility that, that Jalen Milrow could eventually be replaced as Alabama quarterback. Uh, this also being suggested now by some national media types there as well. Well, no evidence that, at least thus far, based on some of the stuff that Kalen DeBoer is saying, DeBoer throwing a lot of praise into uh, the direction of Milrow right now, saying, oh, so far he's been great. He's just listening trying the things that uh, – little tweaks here and there, things he can improve on. He's open to relearning, basically meaning it's going to be a different offensive system now led by Kalen DeBoer. So uh, a lot of kind things being said about Jalen Milrow here right now. And I think this matters because we do believe that Milrow's grip on that quarterback situation, Alabama, might be somewhat tenuous. And in light of the stuff that Nick Saban said the other day that got a lot of attention, Saban's been pretty negative as of late. He talked about he thought the less-than-classy way his team handled its loss to Michigan in the college football playoff, contributing to his decision to retire. Keep in mind, there were some rumors about Milrow 
kind of pouting a little bit after the loss to Texas. And that was perhaps one of the reasons that he was benched the following week against South Florida, that the mood of Milrow has not always been a guarantee for Alabama. And so for now, it looks like certainly uh, Kalen DeBoer is doing everything he can to build that up. Now, maybe it's with good reason. Maybe maybe uh, Milrow really is thriving right now in the new system. But this relationship between Milrow and DeBoer is certainly going to be worth watching. How DeBoer handles this, whether he wants to make the transition to Austin Mack, who a lot of folks think will eventually get the job, or whether he believes that Milrow really is his best option. This is the first big test for Kalen DeBoer to pass as Alabama's football coach, and we'll certainly see how he handles that. And then finally, I'll mention this. In discussing, as I've said, there's an arms race in college football now, right? It's like, you know, the Big Ten wants to be treated the same as the SEC, wants the same slice of the pie, monetarily speaking, from the college football playoff and wants the same number of teams in the playoff and all that kind of stuff. And most of us down here would look up there and say, listen, y'all are not SEC, no matter how hard you try. And, yeah, you may have gotten the national champions here this year, but you've got a long way to go to matching what the SEC does on a regular basis. But I will say this. There are some examples late of that league, the Big Ten, getting a little bit better when it comes to a drama standpoint. You know, the SEC has been pretty famous for drama for a long time. It seems like the Big Ten's doing a little bit better job in cultivating some drama. In fact, Tony Alford, running backs coach at Ohio State, leaving the Buckeyes, take the same job at Michigan. We know Mike Hart's out at Michigan. We talked about that the other day, almost a totally different staff for Sharon Moore up there in Ann Arbor. And going to the hated rival Ohio State to pull Alford away and bring him up there to uh, to Ann Arbor. Now, we don't quite know how Ohio State's going to respond to this as of yet, but this is sort of some SEC-style drama, isn't it? You know, uh, LSU hired Bo Davis away from Texas, for instance. You, you see the sort of poaching of assistant coaches back and forth. Georgia hired T-Rob away from Alabama. This sort of an SEC thing to do, the kind of thing that aggressive moves like this haven't always been made up there in the Big Ten, but perhaps an example of them trying to be a little bit more SEC in their actions. So, I guess maybe it's about time they're on that, and we'll make that cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. Let me also give a shout-out to our friends at the Finish Long Drink. As we head towards the weekend, Finish Long Drink, a great thing to be thinking about as you're enjoying beautiful weather. Y'all know this. I love drinking the Finish Long Drink outside. It's a ready-to-drink cocktail. For me, it just goes great with sunshine. You're sitting on a back patio or around the pool or your front porch, wherever you're enjoying it. What a great time of year to be enjoying yourself some finished long drink, whether it's the peach-flavored version and the peach state for a limited time, the long drink zero, no carbs, no sugar. I still love the traditional and the blue can with the grapefruit kick, uh, grapefruit flavor, the gin kick. That's probably still my favorite. I also love the story. It comes to us from Finland back in the 1950s when the summer games were in Helsinki. And it's been in America now for a few years, and it's been in Georgia there too. And I love seeing folks in our audience continue to try it for the first time and enjoy it and make it a part of what they're doing on a weekend or you know, during the week or, you know, whatever. If you love a mixed drink that you don't want to have to mix yourself, you'll love the ready-to-drink cocktail known as the finished long drink. The cranberry version, the long drink strong, 8.5% alcohol by volume, perhaps. You might in- enjoy that. It's just a wonderful, wonderful addition to a fun category of beverage. We think, by far and away, the best-tasting beverage in that category, the finished long drink. So we would encourage you to try some today. Find them online, thelongdrink.com, for more on that. That's thelongdrink.com for more on that today. So let me say this. One thing you did not hear on today's show, and you heard it, or you didn't hear it for a specific reason. I've been criticized, I would say unfairly, but criticized nonetheless for jinxing the Georgia basketball team this year. That's nonsense. We don't believe in superstition. But Georgia did win last night. Try to not make too big of a deal of it because... I'd like to see it continue. They play again tonight at 9.30. Probably won't. I certainly won't see the end of this game. I'll probably fall asleep before it's over with. But nonetheless, uh, good job uh, for the basketball team beating Missouri last night. Florida here today. Always fun to beat up on the lousy thing in Gators. So best of luck to the Georgia basketball team up in Nashville, the uh, SEC tournament. But we are not jinxing them, but we were glad they won. And by the way, big performance in Blue Cane last night there as well. As far as our golden shoes go for today, how about this? An entirely new era of relations, we think, between the Falcons and the Georgia Bulldogs. We've talked about that a couple of times here this week. Kirk Cousins officially uh, recognized yesterday and, and introduced to Atlanta as the brand-new Falcons quarterback. He puts that on X. Excited to be in Atlanta and become a part of this great organization. My boys and I are learning the Dirty Bird dance. 
uh, as soon as possible, rise up. So you see his beautiful family there. And how about the two kids there in the middle? Both wearing Georgia T-shirts. So the Falcons, on their official count, upon introducing Kirk Cousins to Atlanta, showed off two good-looking kids, both wearing Georgia T-shirts. Obviously, the uh, wife of Kirk is a Georgia grad. We've discussed that. So I would say here for Falcons organization that's perhaps been guilty of not always showing enough love to UGA, maybe Kirk Cousins going to usher in a brand-new era. One can only hope. So far, so good. you love to see that. I mentioned the finished long drink a moment ago. We'll give a golden shoe out as well as we roll into the work towards the weekend. Jake the Rake reached out to me last week to say, enjoying some beer can chicken. Have you ever had that? That's delicious, of course. Also drinking some finished long drink to go along with it. A good way to end a 47-hour weekend. You love that from Jake the Rake. Hashtag go dogs. And to all of you enjoying the finished long drink as you roll towards the weekend. We love all of that. Golden shoes going out to all of you for that but Jake the Rake in particular. By the way, speaking of the lousy stinking Gators, I do not know if Georgia will beat them in basketball. That is obviously not always easy to predict. In football, a little bit more of a sure thing. It's been 1,223 days since Florida's beaten Georgia. That number is going to keep on going up. That is our Gator hater updater. We'll see all of you back here tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Tharp. And on video. Time now for the R.S. Andrews Cool Down. R.S. Andrews is the one you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs, they show up on time. They do the work that's promised, the price that's promised. You can trust R.S. Andrews on all of that. All right, we're not going to go crazy long with comments here today, but uh, we are going to have some fun here nonetheless, though. And we're going to see what's on your mind as we do. Uh, Lance D. says, Cousins is going to force Arthur Blank to finally respect UGA as a source of football talent. I'd say that's the case. And, look, our thing has also been, you got to reach out to these fans because – Whether it's true or not that Georgia has been excluded from the Atlanta Falcons draft considerations, whether that's true or not, the fact that so many Georgia fans believe that it's true is still a problem. And if you want Georgia fans to believe that your organization respects Georgia, you got to show it. you got to demonstrate it. The Atlanta Braves have done that. The Philadelphia Eagles have done that. I would say the Falcons could do more there. And um, I would say Kirk Cousins' kids showing off some Georgia gear in their picture – it's probably a pretty good start there on all of that. You love to see it. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Jay Shipe says two YouTube starts this week. That's amazing. Is that amazing? I feel like I start on YouTube probably a lot. Um, Frank Patterson says, "Did you see the article about the Florida quarterback down here in Miami talking trash to Miami player? We aren't supposed to be worried about y'all. LOL. Who won more games? That's interesting. Is that DJ Lagway that was doing that, or is that a?" Uh, is that Lagway who was doing that? That's pretty interesting. Um, let's see what else. Uh, UGA boy for like Brunetti checking out. We appreciate you being here. Um, let's see what else is going on. Greg Rosenberg said the Falcons should go full UGA in the draft to make up for the years. Bowers, Mims in the first, Laster, Ladd in the second, Smith or Bud in the third. What did they did? They just went just clean sweep like that. I, I'd love to see that. I'd love to see that. Um, and listen, here's what I'll also say too. We've been pretty hard on the Falcons and I would say at times with good reason, I would say the Falcons organization is like the worst combination of arrogance and incompetence. That's what they've been the last few years. They think of themselves as a model organization. The results would obviously speak to that not being true, but at a certain point in time, it can't be all stick, you know, the carrot and the stick. It can't be all stick. You got to give them the carrot every now and then, too. And if they're signing Charlie Warner, you got to celebrate that. And if they're, you know, showing Kirk Cousins' kids wearing the Georgia shirts, you ought to like that. That you don't just win them over by ignoring them or criticizing them. By the way, go look at the Falcons' social media, man. People are hard on the Falcons. And I would say with good reason. I would say with good reason. I just I just said that. Um but people are hard on the Falcons. So if they do something that you like, be nice to them. Be good to them. You know, you know, if, if you want to have more control how your sports entities operate, um, you know, positively incentivize them when they do something that you like and then negatively responding when they do something you don't like, you know, kind of doing both of those. I don't think you should sort of sit there and take it what anything Georgia included. I don't think you just sort of sit there and take whatever they provide for you 
If you like it, let them know. And if you don't, let them know. But the flip side of this, you got to make sure you do both. Because what social media sometimes is, is just sort of a platform for complaining. You can't just complain when they make you mad. If you really want to have influence as a fan, you know, maybe you, I don't know, maybe you go to a game this year if you haven't gone to one. You know, uh, you certainly can, you know, sort of amplify the posts about Charlie Warner or the, or the, you can respond to the the pictures of, of Kirk's kids there. I mean, maybe, you know, you know, a little bit of positive reinforcement when they do something that you like, that's probably a, you know, a good thing there too. Um, uh, Frank Patterson, the subject of his Panthers. Yeah, the Panthers are a little bit of a weird organization here right now. I saw where uh, Luke Holmes was ripping the Panthers the other day. <laughs> uh, so there you go, yeah. Um, let's see what else. Jonathan Aaron says, who do you think the Falcons will draft in the first round? Um, he says, what do the Falcons need the most? Well, unfortunately, right now, they probably need everything. Uh, but here's the thing. You know, I know they've used high draft capital on, um, you know, skill position players the last, what, three years. I still think, though, if you're signing Kirk Cousins to pay him $45 million, giving him everything he needs is really important. So if you need better protection for him along the offensive line, you got to go get it. Or if you need another playmaker for him, uh, you got to go get it. So, you know, I, I'd, I'd look offense right there to sort of match you know, the big move with Kirk Cousins. I know they just signed a receiver too, I guess. But that's what I would, um, that's what I'd look to do. B. Ace Cardigan checks. By the way, I don't know if B. Ace Cardigan was here the other day, but uh, I wore the cardigan the other day. I hope you saw that. I did wear that on the show. Uh, B. Ace Cardigan says the Falcons have had some extremely questionable drafts. You know, doubt about that. They've had a fairly questionable existence. Uh, Greg Rosenberg, going back to an earlier talk about the players only caring about NIL, I can't even bother with recruiting anymore. It's an eBay auction. The only action that counts happens in the last five seconds. I certainly understand why it seems like that's true. It does seem like there's a little bit more swooping in and buying guys late. But I think Terrence and I tried to talk about this a little earlier. There's no one thing that's totally true to the extent to the expense of everything else. Uh, or should say to the exclusion of everything else. In other words, there are some players that all they care about is NIL, and I believe if all you care about is NIL, you're likely making a bad decision. I, I do believe that's true. That if you're going to go to school X, but then you decide to go to school Y because they're going to give you 10 or 15% more NIL, on the basis of just that thing alone, I believe that's probably a bad decision. And I know that as a sort of a professional man that, that you know, just because a company might offer me more money does not mean it's a better job for me. For instance, you know, if I had got offered more money but I had to move my family to Gainesville, Florida to do it, I'm not taking that. Uh, you know, there, there are plenty of times where adults choose less than the absolute highest market value they could acquire because they don't like the trade that you have to make for the additional money. I think college athletes would do right to consider the same thing. Obviously, you know, compensation is going to be a part of this, but, but understand that. But the point we're getting to is, is that, you know, there is no such thing as the sort of like establishment, the coaches, the administrators, they all think one way. And there's no, you know, such thing as the players sort of all think one way either. To the extent that Nick Saban was wrong in what he said the other day, I believe it was wrong from the standpoint it made it sound like it's a blanket deal of everybody's the exact same way. Well, there's no situation in life where everybody is the exact same way. And for every, you know, so-and-so who, you know, all he wants is money, there's also Javon Bullard, who just a couple of years ago during COVID was putting out videos and sending them to Georgia in the hopes of getting Georgia's attention. And that's still a part of college football too. And that's what I tried to say a little earlier. I don't want to be corny about this, really don't, or at least any cornier than I already am. But don't get too cynical. I'm not preaching at you. I'm just saying there is still a lot of good stuff going on, even in the midst of some things perhaps heading in the wrong direction. College football remains an incredibly resilient sport. And I think it's those threads of good in the midst of some stuff that we might say, no matter what side of, by the way, you're on, you may be, you may be opposite of me in terms of what you think the future of college athletics should be like. And yet even you can still find some things you like in the current situation. I may be on the opposite side of you in terms of my opinion about where things should be headed. But once again, 
even if I'm sort of generally kind of, you know, you know, got some negativity about some of this, there's still plenty of positivity to be seen if you know how to look for it. And that's true even in the recruiting process there as well because, listen, there are a lot of people who've been turned off by recruiting forever. I mean, you know, even back when it was what we would think of as a little bit more pure, air quotes. I mean, there are people who thought it was gross back then, some people anyway. Uh, recruiting's become more mainstream, but – Within the last 10 years, there are a lot of people who thought it was just gross. Oh, this is, you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of coaches thought it was gross. Uh, you know, this is not just an NIL thing. Um, let's see what else. G. Grace, I don't know, let me go to the other comment section for a moment. Let me go to dognation.com. Uh, Randy Hall says he's handling car issues this morning, now handling paperwork for some football flights. Uh, I got UT Martin, UTC, Moorhead State, Elon, Furman. Well, there you go. Randy, we're glad you're here today. Um, Scott Harris says he's not quite ready to praise James Coley yet, so we'll see how that goes. We'll see how that goes. Uh, DT reminding you that Pierce Sperling had a little action there in the Orange Bowl, which is kind of a nice thing to think about. Uh, DT says that uh, Carson Beck's not cashing in on his name, image, and likeness. He's cashing in on his ability to play quarterback, two different things. Yeah, but it's like, is Carson Beck a better quarterback than Malachi Starks is a safety? I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't even know how you'd measure that. Um, they're both among the best their position. I would say from that standpoint, Malachi Starks and Carson Beck have fairly equal ability. But Carson Beck has far more market ability because it just so happens that our society just values quarterback almost more than anything. Uh, you know, society values, uh, you know, capable quarterback play almost more than any other resource. So someone like Carson has a very high level of ability. A lot of other Georgia players at their position have a similarly high level of ability, um, but there is just a much greater market ability for someone who plays quarterback. Brandon Griffin says, I don't want to hate Gators just because my grandparents say to them, is it time to give them a second chance? Do Gators change? Yeah, I would say no. I would say no. Uh, I would say that yeah, this is another example of your grandparents sort of getting it right. And, look, I mean, I'll tell you right now, I have definitely kind of reached that age where, like, you know, the wisdom of your parents or your grandparents, things like that, I just find myself thinking about that sort of stuff all the time. You know, they, you know, grandparents just sort of get it right. Uh as it turns out, wisdom of the ages stood the test of time for a reason. Who could have ever guessed it? But as it turns out, that was probably true. Uh, and if your grandparents were teaching you to hate Florida, this is another example of uh, grandma knowing what was what uh, before we even understood. Randy Hall says, is there a survey of the most intimidating stadium? What's your choice for that? So I don't think... I saw Baton Rouge at its best. I've certainly heard a lot of stories about how intimidating it could be. There was sort of a weird period. I've, st I've told this story before. There were probably about 20,000 Georgia fans there the day that Georgia played there in 2018. It's a lot of visiting fans for a trip so far away. Now, Georgia obviously played terrible that day, one of the worst days of the Kirby Smart era. Uh, easy to forget it now, but it was a horrible day. Um, the point is, is that I asked one of the, like the LSU ushers or whatever, I was like, uh, in the stadium, I said, is this the most visiting fans you've ever seen in the stadium? His response to me was really interesting. He said, this is the most LSU fans I've seen in the stadium in quite some time. That for a while, LSU wasn't drawing all that well. And I would say the atmosphere in Baton Rouge the day we were there was a little bit subdued. Um, so I haven't seen it at its best. Now, if you want me to be completely honest without any concern for saying something for me that's a little bit off brand because I don't like saying good things about Georgia rivals, but if you really want me to answer the question, I am forced to be honest and tell you that when Jordan Hare Stadium in Auburn is rocking, that place is a weapon. It absolutely is. And Auburn is such a different team at home, such a different team at home. And I know they've kind of created a similar atmosphere for basketball. I will never give Auburn credit for anything. It's just, you know, even if I was tempted to, it just wouldn't be good business. I'm never going to do it. 
Um, but you can't deny that crowd can be impactful. When Georgia played there in November 2017, House of Horrors, House of Horrors. Now, Auburn hadn't done, you know, hadn't been a blip on the radar in, 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 in life since then. Uh, but that day, crowd was plenty loud, was plenty loud, was plenty loud. Um, uh, PDT says for BA's NIL instead of a Lamborghini, he'd have a, a cruise ship rental. Yeah, I'd much rather have a, a Royal Caribbean NIL than a Lamborghini. I, I, listen, I think Lambos are cool, uh, obviously, but as I said before, I'm not cool. So it's like if you saw me driving around in a car that was too cool, well, that wouldn't even be a fit. Like, what is this dude dr- doing driving this car? Um, I look like I stole it uh, or something. Or I don't know what I'd look like, but I, it wouldn't seem right for me. So um, Lamborghinis are cool, but I am not cool. So therefore, now Carson Beck's quarterback. He probably is cool. Um, I would say not every quarterback's cool, but he probably is. I think Kirk Cousins is sort of proudly uncool. Uh, my guess is he probably doesn't drive one of those. Um, Beck probably is cool. So he probably, you know, fits well with the with the Lamborghini. Me, I'm not cool. Um, so I don't, I mean, listen, if you gave me a Lamborghini, I probably wouldn't turn it down. But there's a pretty good chance I wouldn't know how to drive it. My guess is that's not just, you know, <laughs> get in there and, you know, push the starter button and just go. My guess is there's some sort of, like, magic trick you have to have to make that thing even put and drive. I'm guessing. So, uh, like, the, the, you know, every, every now and then for some of our, you know, trips, you know, rent a car, just, you know, business-wise, that's what they ask you to do, ask you to rent a car. And every now and then I'll be given a car rental that's just a little too fancy for me. Like, it's the only car they had available, so they just gave it to me. And I'm telling you right now, like, some of this car technology, I can barely I, I can barely even process. Uh, I can barely even process. Um, PDT says, would a cruise ship fit in your garage? Listen, I'd like to have a garage where, where it did. Um, I'd like to have that. Oh, Doggy says that Malachi Starks does have the national brand deal with Powerade. So there you go. Uh, let's see what else is going on here. Randy Hall says we're wearing a bright red shirt today. Yeah, this is one of those, like, just to be honest with you, this is one of those, like, nice Georgia shirts. Like, I'm not a huge fan of, like, the Nike Georgia stuff because, like you said, like, some of the color stuff on that on that Nike gear is just off a little bit. I'm totally honest. So This is one of, like, the slightly more expensive ones, and it does just seem like the color just pops better, right? I mean, you know, you don't necessarily want the expensive thing to be better because, you know, clothes are expensive enough as it is. In this particular case, some of the Georgia gear you pay a little bit more for, I would say, is a better quality of product. At least, at least that's been my experience. Uh, at least that has been my experience. All right, let me go to uh, the Facebook side of things and see what folks are saying over there. We'll get ready to bounce out of here in a few minutes after that. Maybe a little shorter than normal. But we shall see. On Facebook here, Johnny Prescott says, off the top of my head, I can't think of anyone who has leveraged their skill level into more dollars than Kirk Cousins. I mean, how many how many businesses in America generate more revenue than Cousins will have for his career? And, you know, like you hear about, well, $45 million sounds like a lot for a quarterback. You know, A, Falcons have to spend it on something, and it's not my money, so I don't really worry about that kind of stuff too much. But sometimes I think about, like, how much some of these athletes get paid. Like, like I mean, they're generating more money, you know, on a yearly basis than a lot of very, you know, decent-sized corporations are. Jacob O'Neill says, I finally showed up. So I've gotten criticized both on YouTube and Facebook for my handling of comments today. Um Matt Rugovini is taking his kids to SeaWorld in San Antonio today. How about that? Yeah, Matt's a Texas guy. Many of y'all know that. We went to SeaWorld, gosh, it's probably been eight years ago or so. Uh, different than I remember when I was a kid. I feel like SeaWorld's a little bit different now. You know, they don't get the, the what do you call them, trainers or performers. They don't get in the water with the whales anymore. And I know there was all kinds of issues. I do realize that. But they don't do that anymore. Did notice that. I like I like I like shows involving like dolphins and whales and things like that. The the dolphin show at the Georgia Aquarium I think is pretty good. Um, 
I like I like those. T- I, I like when I go on, you know, uh, Royal Caribbean Cruise, it's a place off in Nassau that has dolphins, and they do like little jumps and stuff like that. I enjoy that. Um, uh, Matt Rukavina says his uh, son wonder if the dolphins are going to wear they're white or they're green there at SeaWorld today. There you go. That's a, that's a football fan in training right there. That's good stuff. Randy Hall predicting 20-plus commits between now and the end of July, so there you go. Bill Sanders says, if you haven't been to a true night game at LSU at 9 p.m., you don't know what you're missing. It's really quite eerie, and the vibes will mess with your head. Yeah, I mean, I've heard good things, but probably did not see the best, if you want to call it that, of the LSU crowd when we were there in 2018. I also didn't see anywhere close to the best from Georgia, so perhaps the LSU crowd (laughs) either did more than I realized or wasn't needed at all. Um Jacob O'Neill says um, that I need to be given more of an NIL deal to take better care of the Facebook audience. Well, I don't know that I need that, but if y'all want to offer one, I might not turn it down either. Brandon Griffin says that Carson Beck definitely sounds more confident this year. Yeah, when Beck speaks to me, he always kind of comes across as having the right kind of confidence, the sort of measured confidence of someone who's counted the cost and determined that he's equal to the task. I always sort of like that. Matthew Goodwin says, I wouldn't have a high-end car because I'm too practical. It's probably $2,000 for an oil change. See, I sort of fear the same thing. However, I want to make one thing clear. I was actually thinking about this. This is like a tiny soapbox for like five seconds. I am not anti-luxury good. Now, I don't need a Lamborghini because I really probably would not know how to use one. But that doesn't mean that I wouldn't be happy with a nice car. I just don't know that I need a really nice sports car. Now, I think that Beck's Lambo is a SUV anyway, but this is a good tiny soapbox. I am not anti-luxury good. I think that luxury goods are fine. Uh, you know, good for people who sell them, good for people who make them. I would certainly not tell those people who make the living and feed their family on the basis of either selling or producing luxury goods that somehow they're contributing negatively to society. I, th- I think that's far from the case. So count me as someone who is pro-luxury good. Now, nobody should uh, spend more than they can afford on something, but if you aspire to buy a Rolex, I think you should. If you aspire to buy a whatever car you like, if it is a Lamborghini, because, you know, one way or another, that's just a sum of money, um, whether it be, you know, 10 times more than you've ever played, paid for a car or five times more than you've ever paid for a car, it's still just a sum of money. Um, so I am pro-luxury good. Um, I don't know. A little soapbox for you there for two seconds. Uh, Craig Jones pointing out that you park a Lamborghini on campus, there are door dings, and then there are door dings. Yeah, that's the thing is, like, some of those, you know, Georgia, like every other college in America, there's nowhere to park. And so you're squeezing that thing in pretty tight. Now, my guess is Beck is probably taking all of his classes online. I'm, I'm guessing Carson Beck's not showing up, you know, at, you know, so-and-so classroom and sitting down and taking a cut class if I had to guess. Uh, but even just sort of driving that thing downtown, it's like the point of having a car like that is being seen driving it, I guess. Like, would I want to drive that downtown? Like, because I'm always worried about I don't even have that nice of a car, but I'm always worried about getting door dings and stuff like that. Actually, I told you this a couple of years ago. Like, I was driving, like, a really junky car. Like, it was really junky. And part of me loved the fact that I didn't care where I parked it. Like, I, I didn't care. Um, um if it gotten towed, I probably wouldn't have even gone to pick it up. Like it was just, you know, it just, it's like you just park it wherever. If somebody slams the door on it, whatever else, it's like you got too nice of a car. I'm always worried about door dings, things like that. But if you have a, you know, a car that's beat up enough, listen, I'll park that thing in, in the grass somewhere and just, you know, just leave it there. Um, and Jeff Ingram says, I'll take my 64 VW Beetle that got me through UGA J school as my memory car. There you go, Jeff. I like that. I like that. My dad had a, uh, a a Volkswagen when I was a kid, like a, one of those traditional Beetles. I don't know what year it would have been. It probably wouldn't have been a 64, I don't think. I guess, could have, I guess it could have been that old maybe. Um, uh, Marshall Fleming, I'll talk about williams Bryce Stadium being loud. Yeah, this is another one of those things that Georgia fans wouldn't want me to necessarily say, but I do think that williams Bryce Stadium, I think their crowd does a really good job. And one of the things I've always respected South Carolina fans for, and – once again, this is maybe slightly off-brand, but I'll say it nonetheless, is they find a way to be really loud, even when their team is not very good, and their team is almost never good, and yet, yet somehow they find a way to still show up. I've got respect for that. I've got respect for that. All right. Um, let's 
do a couple more here before we go. Yeah, Johnny Prescott kind of agreeing that on Williams Bryce. Yeah, I mean, I've been there a good number of times. I think it's fun. And I mean, obviously, as a wrestling fan, I sort of like the Ric Flair 2001 music they play. And I got to be honest with you, I know it gets on people's nerves. I sort of like that sandstorm thing. I, I, I do think it's kind of cool when they crank that up. And I think the fact that Georgia has never quite found its own song that sort of matches the same thing there. Like some people are overly critical of the game day atmosphere at Georgia. I would say for the most part, it's more good than not. But I do think it could be beefed up just a little bit. And, you know, that's an example of the type of thing that, you know, a school like South Carolina has that Georgia hasn't quite had. All right, one more trip around the other comment section. We're going to go here. Paul Moon says the rooster crows like nails on the chalkboard, even on TV. Yeah, we talked the other day about they're having a Premier League game there uh, this summer. You sort of wonder, is the rooster going to come out for that? You sort of wonder if that's the case. Um Yeah, Paul Moon, yeah, bringing up the rooster sound. Yeah, for sure, for sure. G. Gray says uh, that he would have gotten a Lambo, I think he says. Uh, not the girly version, get the car. Uh, so I guess he's not a fan of the SUV. Um, yeah, I think if I was going to go, like, ultra elite sports car, I would probably go Ferrari, I think. I know Beck said this week he likes a Ferrari, too. For some reason, I think I'd probably go Ferrari. I don't really know why. I, just think that I, I sort of like the sort of the contour of the Ferraris, at least the ones that I see. But I'm also just sort of like an, like honestly, I, I think I'd probably just really have like a really nice American car. As, as I said before, it's like, you know, I just want something that sort of feels comfortable. I want something kind of big because I'm fairly big. I want something that, that I fit in. I, I think I'd probably do that. So if I was going to get a sports car, I'd probably just get a Corvette or something. Uh, and Carson said he grew out of being a uh, Mustang. I mean, I don't even hate the Mustangs. Oh, Frank Patterson says they're bringing back the Bojangles williams Bryce Stadium. I used to love that thing. You see it there all the time. Now, since I brought that up, people say there's actually Bojangles still fairly close to there. What's well, the Carolinas? There are Bojangles everywhere. But there used to be one right next to the stadium, and I ate there so many times, so many times. Yeah, Frank Patterson, I like the new Corvette body style as well. Brandon Griffin also likes the classic 50s and 60s version. I like that there too. Um... Curtis Jackson says, I'm not allowed to talk about basketball. I can't talk about Carson Beck's car anymore. <laughs> it's a fair point. If, it, if, there are, if there are jinx potential, then maybe it's maybe that's a blanket jinx on everything. Um, all right. Anything else before we go here? Let me go back to dognation.com. And we'll say goodbye from there. A DT says Athens also got a lot of bad drivers, bad place for a nice car. Yeah, here's the thing. And it is just a it's just a fact that, you know, as as Georgia has gotten more prestigious as a school, my guess is, this is this is a theory, this is a hypothesis. My guess is as Georgia has gotten more prestigious as a school, the socioeconomic status of the typical Georgia student has also gone up as well, which means the likelihood of a student driving a car they didn't pay for has also gone up too. Now, let me tell you how people treat cars that they're driving they didn't pay for. Oftentimes, not particularly well. Some of you know this from your own uh, uh, high school age drivers. Some of you know this from when you were a high school age driver. But people who drive a car they didn't pay for have a tendency to not be super careful with that car. And... Um, so if you're seeing a preponderance of bad driving in Athens, there may be something related to that, if I had to guess. PDT also taking it back to the 80s uh, era Ferrari from uh, Magna PI. One of the things I like about toys, you know, my son's sort of out of that phase of, of childhood now, but it's like all the toys, all the like the cool cars from TV, they still make toys of all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, love that. You know, I loved all the car shows. Knight Rider, Dukes of Hazard. I remember the Magnum PI, you know, Ferrari. You know, I, the A-Team van, the black thing with, like, the red stripe on it. Um, back then, a lot of shows had, like, prominent vehicles in them. Always a big fan of all that. Always a big fan of that. All right. Um, we got to go. Good stuff. Y'all check out R.S. Andrews online. Now, listen, Dari Payro, 
drive a Lamborghini, drive a Ferrari, drive anything else. He's cool enough to do that. Me, probably not. But Dari, definitely could. And uh, when you check out R.S. Andrews online, uh, not only will you find out how cool Dari Pero is, but you can stay cool yourself. How about that for a transition? All spring and summer long. Get that air conditioning unit tuned up. Be ready to go for all that. Find them online at rsandrews.com. Warm today. They can get your air conditioning unit ready for what's coming next. And it may only cost you 99 bucks. Get it tuned back up to factory fresh specs and get you comfortable and cool new life out of that old unit for the rest of this spring and summer online, rsandrews.com. For more on that, you all have a great day. Uh, we'll see you back here tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily presented by Meriwether and Tharp. R.S. Andrews Cool Down when it's all said and done. We'll talk to you then, everybody.